Hi, I'm Don Miller, and this is History in Five. Today we're going to be talking about New York in the Jazz Age, the 1920s. The Midtown Manhattan we know today, the area from Times Square northward to Central Park, was created in the 1920s. And this explosion of commerce and culture began with the completion just before World War I of the new Grand Central Terminal on East 42nd Street. In 1900, the area just north of the original Grand Central Station, built by Commodore Vanderbilt, was an enormous smoke-filled rail yard, three-quarters of a mile long and a quarter of a mile wide. In one of the great urban transformations of the age, Grand Central's chief engineer, William Wilgus, buried the tracks underground, electrified the trains, and had his company begin building on the roof of the terminal a Parisian-like boulevard of tall, regal apartment houses, a new Park Avenue, the greatest concentration of wealth on earth. The Manhattan building boom of the 1920s was almost unprecedented in the history of cities. In 1920, there were no skyscrapers in midtown Manhattan. Ten years later, half the city's skyscrapers are located there. And West 42nd Street near Grand Central Terminal was home to three of the world's tallest towers, the Daily News Building, built by newspaper titan Joseph Patterson, founder of the country's first tabloid newspaper, the Channon Building, the inspiration of Brooklyn's Irwin Channon, who was broke in 1919 and a rich real estate developer seven years later, and the Chrysler Building, the dream project of automobile Walter Chrysler, a former railroad mechanic from Kansas. Walter Chrysler's Silver Spire was the tallest structure in the world when it was opened in 1930, a year before the completion of the even taller Empire State Building. Duke Ellington called Manhattan the capital of everything. In the 20s, it became suddenly and spectacularly the capital of radio, America's radio city. In 1920, there was no commercial radio in New York or anywhere else. By 1927, radio was America's newest big industry, and radio stocks were flying high on Wall Street. Two New Yorkers were behind this radio revolution, David Sarnoff and William Paley. In 1926, Sarnoff, an immigrant from Belarus, assembled the world's first radio network, NBC. A year later, Paley, a young Playboy millionaire from Philly, arrived in New York and established the second national radio network, CBS, beginning a fiercely contested rivalry with Sarnoff that lasted into the 1960s. When you think of New York's sporting scene in the 1920s, you think of Babe Ruth. But 1927, the year Ruth hit his record-breaking 60 homers, Heavyweight boxing was more popular than baseball, and the highest paid athlete in America was savagely aggressive Jack Dempsey, one of the most hated and revered boxers of all time. Dempsey's career was guided by a master promoter and con artist named Tex Rickard, a former sheriff from Texas cow country. Before Rickard arrived in New York in 1920 and took control of Madison Square Garden, most championship fights were held before all-male crowds in western mining towns. Rickard made them big urban spectacles with ringside seats reserved for millionaires and movie stars, male and female. Women felt safe at a Rickard fight, protected by a small army of thick-necked guards. With Dempsey as his drawing card, he made boxing into big business. In Dempsey's fight against French challenger George Carpentier, the first of Rickard's unprecedented six million dollar gates, the New York Times devoted 13 pages to the fight, and young David Sarnoff, partnering with Rickard, broadcast the match to nearly half a million listeners. Radio and record ushered in the age of mass spectacle sport. The owner of Harlem's Cotton Club was mobster Oni Madden, a stone-cold killer in his younger days in Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan's toughest slum. In 1927, Madden was a well-known Broadway big shot, owner of exclusive clubs and of an enormous red brick brewery in his old neighborhood protected from federal prohibition agents by New York cops and politicians in his pay. But hardly anybody knew then, and hardly anybody knows today, that Madden was partners with two other bootleggers, Big Bill Dwyer, a prominent restaurant owner who brought professional hockey to New York, and Frank Costello, an Italian-born gangster who became a mafia chieftain in the 1930s. 